anytime somebody says something that starts with people like or people don't like, the, the rest of the sentence is about to be really stupid. Because when you homogenize human humanity, you kind of throw away uh, all of this stuff that we've found uh, about how people think differently from each other. So Welcome to 33 Tangents, a roundtable discussion covering a wide variety of topics from digital analytics to working remotely to current happenings in business and technology. Your hosts, Jason Thompson, John Naran, Jen Coons, and myself, Jim Driscoll, all live in different areas of the world, but work together in the same company. Our regular day-to-day -day conversations often go off in various directions, and the goal of this podcast is to share our ideas and find new ways to engage with others. So just before you joined, I was telling Jason, I said, I'm feeling much better than uh, than I did uh, yesterday afternoon. Something just hit me like right after lunch and it just like drained me. So, uh, so fortunately feeling uh, much better this morning and uh, uh, ready to go with this conversation, which I think is really going to be a fun one. Good. Yeah, me too. I'm, I'm about 80% through my coffee. So hopefully the, uh, the caffeine starts kicking in. I was also, nice. I was also telling Jim that his wife's a badass. What well, she's like, I, I don't know, like eight and a half months pregnant or something. Uh, about and seven I, and a half. Yeah. Okay. Seven and a half, almost but eight. still like she, she's got a big baby bump going on. And, uh, I saw her picture of her at the, at the gym doing squats with like 300 pounds on the barbell or something. I'm like, Holy <laughs> shit. Like, I couldn't even imagine doing that not pregnant. Like, she's a badass. How much did you squat when you were pregnant? <laughs> uh, I will tell you that my sophomore year of, of the high school, I um, I was on the, uh, the tennis team, and uh, we had to do weight training, and I had trouble getting up the bar uh, on the bench press. So you can probably translate to how much I could squat being or not being pregnant <laughs> but uh it, but i thank you and i'll let her know that because it's definitely impressive she's still been hitting the gym about three days a week you know obviously as the pregnancy's moved along she's been able to do less and less and so every now and then she'll come home a little frustrated i can't do this i'm like you know you're pregnant at this point you were still there you were still active and after the baby's born and you start to heal up you'll get back there and you'll get back to right where back to uh to where you were yeah, yeah. Jim, Jim and his wife make me feel incredibly lazy. Um, although I've been trying to be a, a lot more active, you know, they are always hitting the gym and uh, I don't know marathons. I, it's it's crazy, but it's it's good. It, it's good to mm -hmm. see because it it uh, it's a good motivator. So yeah, I get all of my exercise in two months out of the year in the summertime. <laughs> and then, is is that is that walking like the golf course? There's some golf, there's some mountain biking, uh, there's some hiking that happens, things like that. And then I'm like a bear. I go, I go back into my cave yeah. and I, I eat lots of berries and get really yes. fat. So I don't get cold. <laughs> Completely understand. Well, uh, those that are listening may uh, recognize we have a special guest today uh, with Evan LaPointe joining us. Um, man, super excited to have this conversation. I'm sure that the majority of the people listening uh, are well aware of, of Evan, but I thought I would do a little intro, let you talk a little bit uh, about yourself, Evan, and, and what you've been up to, and then would love to to jump into to our topic today, uh, if that works for you. Yeah. Cool. So Evan and I have been uh, acquaintances and then friends for, for quite some time. Um and uh, I, I've been getting in the habit of posting this screenshot from uh, what is this app that I still use that no one else in the world uses, Swarm, um, to track my check-ins. And um, I, I vividly remember, I don't know if you remember this, but we were at a, a Google Analytics user conference. I think it was 2012. We were at the computer 
science history museum uh, in the Bay Area, and we're having lunch outside on a patio. Uh, and I just remember like just sitting there mesmerized listening to you talk about your goals and visions and what you want to do. I'm like, dude, this guy, man, like, I don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be pretty amazing. And uh, hopefully I, I can be a little part of it. Um, so I, you know, I don't know if you remember that, but I, I remember that, uh, that lunch, um, amazingly well. And I, and I always look back to it as a, as a kind of a turning point where, you know, I've been able to listen even at afar at, at what you're doing and, and take great motivation from, from the words that you have to say. So that's why I'm really excited about, uh, today's conversation. Um, so Evan started, uh, a company, um, built a, really amazing product called Satellite um, in the tag management space. It was later acquired by Adobe. Adobe rebranded it as DTM, became a real game changer for them and has been um, a huge trajectory on their product roadmap and leading to a lot of the innovations they're doing today, not only in the tag management space with Launch, but all of their their other platforms really being um, built together and and really leveraging the power of a connected cloud ecosystem. So, you know, Evan's done some amazing things. He's um, on a new journey now, started up a new company called Core, which Evan, I'd love for you to introduce and and talk about what you're doing there. And uh, today he's joining us. We we talked to the audience and seemed we had a pretty split response between um, our listeners wanting to hear Evan talk about what does the future of analytics look like? And especially for a lot of our listeners in the digital space, what does that look like? You know, it seems like we maybe have been stuck for a little while, or maybe we're now making moves into new areas. What what does Evan see in his crystal ball? And then what is the overlap between psychology and, and analytics look, look like? And I know that's an area that you're really passionate about. And I've seen you talk a lot about psychology and innovation and, um, you know, how that's coming out to play in, in this new company you're building. So that's a quick intro of Evan. Um, what do you want to add to it? Love for you to talk a little bit about what you're doing at core and then let's jump into our main topic. Yeah. Um, as I remember that, that lunch at the Google meeting, um, yeah, we did talk about dreams and aspirations, but I don't think you stood up and said, wow, that's impressive. I think you stood up and said, wow, this guy's totally full of shit. <laughs> and uh, False. I would never say that. <laughs> but uh, no, that was, it, it's cool that the history goes so far back. And, you know, the fact that you and I both share that length of history with so many interesting people in this industry who have done so many interesting things, it's it's very neat. And And not only is it cool that, that we know those people uh, and they're accessible to us. But one of the things I'm proudest of in this industry is how everybody makes themselves accessible to pretty much everybody. And maybe that's the first uh, clippy in the corner of your Microsoft document suggestion is that to anybody who's earlier on in this industry, um, there are just so many people who are kind of farther down the road who are super accessible and people are not taking enough advantage of that at all. So uh, whether it's me or you or, or you know, any of the kind of, uh, you know, the alumni class of, of early analytics, um, people should be reaching out more and, and talking and interacting more with the people who can kind of help them skip a few steps. No, totally, totally agree. Um, and that's that's always been an amazing thing about our, our industry. Um, and I think it was a little more open maybe back in the Twitter day, although there's a, a huge audience on on Slack now and lots of uh, young analysts and implementers and optimization strategists on there. And yeah, it is amazing to see that everyone from really high level product managers to practitioners to people that have started companies just willing to, to help people uh, get started and mature in their career. It's an amazing thing about the space that um, I, yeah, I hope everyone's taking advantage of. Yeah, so so maybe Clippy can be our mascot for the conversation today. And and Clippy is saying, hey, it looks like you're starting a <laughs> career. <laughs> you should talk to these people and skip a bunch of steps. And for those um, of you just yeah. starting a career, Clippy, <laughs> they're probably like, what yeah, the hell is yeah, that yeah, talking yeah. about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe people don't even know what Clippy is anymore. But yeah, I mean, the journey to, to core has been a winding road, but I think kind of a road of, of inevitability in a sense that um, 
anybody who's been in this industry for a while, we kind of know we're familiar with everything that's been tried. And then we learn something when we try things and that allows us to dig a little bit deeper. And over the course of my career, uh, starting several companies, kind of joining in with companies that are on their way and, and helping to team up with them and take them to the next level. Um, this whole notion of, of psychology has kind of been the core uh, and, the, and the reason for naming the business of everything that I've hit when I've said, why did that just happen? Why did we make a mistake there? Why did that person hear that information that way? Why did we give that presentation and it, it was received so poorly? Why did we set such idiotic goals? Whatever, whatever the case might be, it, it's like all roads lead to this point. And after, after working a lot in data, which I think you and I have talked a lot about this, that the hypothesis of, or, or at least kind of the, the theory of why both of us got in this industry was if we share this insight with people, it will be impossible to debate what we should do. It will be so clear what we should do uh, as a business to allocate our resources and change interfaces and, and make new experiences and products. But as we found out, it's, it's not impossible to <laughs> look the other way. And um, I got a little tired of that, quite frankly. And, and I think what I'm recognizing is that if we, if we work on the components of the company that are deeper down, then we can be a lot more successful. And core is trying to help people organize their thinking in companies. Uh, oh, we got doorbells going off. Um, but it's it's trying to help people organize their thinking. And one of the metaphors I use is that it's kind of like a computer. Your company is kind of like a computer. And we're trying to install hot new applications on our computer, like an, an application for analytics or an application for more creativity and innovation. And in order for you to successfully install a piece of software on a computer, it has to be compatible with the computer. And it has to be compatible with the operating system, which is kind of like the culture. Can our culture actually ad adopt this application? Can we, ha have we set ourselves up in our behaviors and our mindsets up in a way that allows analytics to plug into the system and actually work and integrate with the other applications on the system? And even below the culture of the operating system, we still have the hardware. And that's what what the, the idea of core is, is that the hardware is the psychology. It is our set of stable motivations that we all bring into our everyday life. And people's stable motivations are different from one another. And if we hire armies full of certain types of people, it makes it more likely that a culture will end up a certain way because only certain cultures can be installed on certain hardware <laughs> in, in a sense. And then of course, when we try the applications, you know, we just have compatibility issues across all three of these layers. And we see it every day where a company will attempt to do some hot new trick. And not only does it bounce off of the castle wall of the culture, but there's like an additional inner castle wall that if it somehow sticks itself to the, the culture for a minute, it's somebody will come around who is kind of diametrically opposed to thinking that way. Their, their mindset works differently and they'll make sure it gets killed off. And the faster that we recognize that, the faster we can start to operate on the right layer of the company so that we can essentially upgrade ourselves and make us capable of new things. So where within the organization do, does, a, does one start? You know, when you're thinking about core, where do you like to go in? And, you know, it's, it's interesting this... Um, <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to plug this quote again from John Wooden that has seemed to come up on like three or four of our last podcasts, but I think it, it plays so well with what we're talking about. And I, I can't even remember the first instance this, this, the instances that this came up, but the quote is one of the greatest motivating factors is the pat on the back. Although with some individuals, you have to make the pat a little lower or a little harder. And, you know, by that meaning that if you're taking everyone on your team as the same, you're, you're not going to be successful. And John Wooden was amazingly successful. And he had this ability to use psychology to 
not only understand himself really well, but understand how he acts and how he processes information in relation to how everyone on his team did the same. And they were all different. And I know that's something you and I have talked a lot about is really investing in understanding yourself and how you think and process information and and react to things. But just as importantly, how that works in the context of everyone that you're interacting with and, and trying to understand them a little better. So, you know, if we're working with organizations and we're trying to be more creative, we're trying to be more innovative, where do we start? Does that come from the top down? Do we start in influential departments? Do we start with the department that raises their hand and says, we're interested in this? You know, where do you attack it from? Yeah, I, I mean, so to drill into that idea, first of all, John's uh, pat on the back and lower and harder was was just kind of a hysterical thing that popped in my mind is like John has two systems of motivating one is thanking and one is spanking is is that what we're supposed to <laughs> right under, right. understand from right that? but but you know um I think the 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 issue that a lot of people face when they try to change an organization for the better is that they immediately try to answer the question, how do we do this at scale? And I think that's like a really stupid question to answer early on. And it gets it gets asked early on all the time, just like what's the ROI of this idea gets asked really, really early on. And I was reading a book, um, uh, what is it called? The, the one that Kim wrote with the orange cover, Radical Candor. Um, and in Radical Candor, she talks about um, discussing ideas with Johnny Ive from Apple. And he talked about how fragile ideas are when they're young and how they really have to be cared for because they're so easy to kill. And in both cases, trying to figure out how to scale something or how to do something at scale from the beginning and also trying to figure out the ROI of an idea too early is an easy way of eliminating an idea and, and filtering it out and killing it off so that we can focus on other things. But if we give ourselves more time, we'll realize that that idea actually has way more value than we initially saw on the surface. And when it comes to changing cultures like this in companies, I think you abandon scale and you try to create an outlier. So you work on one project or you work on one team and you try to figure out, okay, what's standing in our way with this one project? Let's not do this everywhere. Because if you can figure that out with one project, remove the barrier, get some sort of a response in the form of that project going much better than it would have otherwise, then you can say, okay, where else does this same barrier uh, exist around the organization? And we can start the effort of the, the contagious effort of spreading that out across the organization. But again, being intentional and saying, okay, what worked for the marketing organization might not work for the product organization the same way. So... I think just kind of avoiding the the notion of scale is is the starting point. But when you do look at the outlier team, I think you know we'll we'll kind of beat the psychology stick pretty hard in this conversation. Um, one of the things that you'll hear a lot of people say is that people don't like change. and i'm I'm using this example to kind of take us down a road and then back to where we are. And anytime somebody says something, that starts with people like or people don't like the the rest of the sentence is about to be really stupid because when you homogenize human humanity you kind of throw away uh, all of this stuff that we've found uh, about how people think differently from each other so yeah it may be true that some people don't like change but it is true that other people do like change and if we generalize the concept that people don't like change then what we'll do is we'll try to teach people who don't like change how to like change, even though for 30 or 40 years on this planet, they have repeatedly daily said, I don't like change. If we instead say there are some people who don't like change and some people who do like change, then we can go get the people who do like change and bring them in to help us with the change, not try to get non-change people to bring about change. And it's kind of like if we did the same thing with dogs, for example, and said, you know, the average dog isn't that good at following a scent. Well, then we would say, okay, well, what can we do to make them better? Maybe we can train a bunch of Shih Tzus and Chihuahuas how to be crime dogs who can follow scents. Or we can recognize that on average, a dog isn't that great at it. 
uh, across all breeds, but some breeds are extraordinary at it. So let's go get the bloodhounds to do that particular job. And I think that's what we have to focus on as a starting point is who is naturally motivated in this way? Are we trying to be creative? Should we take this person who's super uncreative all the time uh, and try to you know, squeeze that fruit? Or should we go take a person who's super creative who can just kind of help us think a different way? Yeah. And man, I have so many questions and I want to be focused in my questioning. And so if, if I'm kind of rambling or going in too many tangents, pun intended, um, please refocus. So I have, I have two kind of follow-up questions. One, just more out of interest from a historical standpoint. Um, and then one more of a practical, how we deploy this across departments question. So I'll go with the, the historical question first. How do you think we 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 got here, um, and why is now it becoming more important, or maybe it always has been, and it's just something that that I'm noticing now. But if I look back in in history and say we go back to the middle of last century, it seemed it seems like you know these conversations weren't important. In fact, I think they were were buried, and that corporate employees were looked at almost like clones like we were playing a role and we all had to be the same in fact there were things called charm schools where you went and you were taught how to be a good corporate employee and how to act and, and carry yourself and you know we don't talk about feelings and we don't talk about how people think and do things differently it's you do things the corporate way and now we're you know a good chunk of the way into this century now we're, we're pivoting the conversation into saying no this is critically important if we want to stay ahead and be on the the edge of innovation to understand that people are different and there are feelings and we can introduce psychology into these kind of very rigid departments and it's okay um is is has this been a a change in how businesses have viewed things or is it just becoming more apparent that this was always something that was important to talk about all right so i'm going to i'm going to try to answer this in the the simplest way possible because it's a it's a really good and really interesting question that i i've thought a lot about and i don't know if i really have the perfect answer for you but this is what sits Night, you know, this is what sits well in my mind. If we look back, like you said, at kind of the army's cultures, where where we tried to create uh, homogenous cultures, at the core, that is a result of those who were in power at the time. Now, power is an interesting thing um, because power is not a motivation of all people. It's, it's a strong motivation of some people. And it's not coincidental that the people who most want power are typically the most successful at getting it. And on a psychological level, what, what pairs up with this notion of power is orderliness and, um, and structure. So back in the, the days of charm school, I, I know that's, that's, that's a great example. Back in those days, the people would get power and then they would look across and they would say, okay, what are the best qualities of people? We want people to be responsive and diligent and focused and hardworking and empathetic. And they take all the good qualities of people. And then they would attempt to make all people just have those good qualities in a forceful way, right? Because that's what power does. Power attempts to manipulate other people to make them behave they want them to behave. And then over time, like you said, we've evolved away from that simply because it fails. If a, if a powerful person attempts to make all people act the same way, which by the way is kind of, if you talk to a psychologist or, or a neurosurgeon, and ask them how realistic that would be, they would both tell you it's totally impossible uh, for many, many reasons, but it will fail as a result of that manipulative tactic of gaining power, finding, let's call them best practices of behavior, and then attempting to create homogenous behavior with those best practices. It's a, it's a, it's a tyrannical form of management. Whereas what we're evolving toward, and we saw this in marketing early on, just with segmentation. And Malcolm Gladwell gave a, a great TED talk 
not about a, a psychological factor, but just taste. He talked about um, how the how ragu and prego were at war in the grocery store to see who would like what pasta sauce, and they were both trying to make one pasta sauce that everybody likes. And then one of them decided, what if we made three different sauces, one spicy, one traditional, and one chunky? And what they saw when they brought those out into the um, the test rooms to to let people try them out is that the average score when people could select the one that they most like went up above the highest achievable score of one sauce. So they they bought in this concept that like different people like different things. So we need to make a few different things so that across the board, people can be more satisfied. And of course, it came over to marketing, and that's much more psychological in nature. Some people like social proof and social validation uh, as a form of feeling safer to buy something. Some people like facts and figures and benefits. Some people like um, understanding the possibilities of it. So now marketing offers different messages for different mindsets. And it's just because trying to make the one perfect pasta sauce doesn't work. In old management theory, where we tried to make one pasta sauce of behavior, it, it fails. And it's just that failure that leads us away from it. And what's funny is you kind of always see people reverting to it. You always, you always see, like in Patrick Lencioni's book, with The Advantage, which there's a lot of good things in that book, but there are some horrifically awful things in that book too, that we're trying to create this consistency of behavior and we're trying to specialize and separate and divide as opposed to we're trying to bring intelligence together and cover for bias, which is really the purpose of collaboration, which we can branch down that road and that topic separately. But yeah, to kind of more concisely answer your question, it's those who seek power are usually the first to get it. And then once they get it, they try out their theories and then their theories usually suck because their theories are based on order and consistency and and uh, how they feel about people because powerful people want their mindset imposed on the world, not the world's realities imposed on their mindset. So and, and then it fails and then we adapt and then we start new cycles and we mm -hmm. try to we, yep. we do it again and again and again. Yeah, that makes sense. And that you, yeah, I, I'm glad you brought up the uh, the Gladwell piece. I will definitely link up the TED talk in the show notes because that's a, a really interesting one. And and as a if you're more of a reader, um, there's a fantastic long form article written by Malcolm Gladwell in the New Yorker back in 2004 called the Ketchup Conundrum, which talks about this whole thing with Prego and 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 the choices of spaghetti sauce. It's a fascinating read. So I will I'll link that up as well, just as a as a side note. So uh great answer. My 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 second question around kind of some practical uh ways of um deploying this, and I'm interested to see if you've seen something similar in that I've seen teams that have been very progressive in the past and have introduced, you know, pieces of some of these concepts that that you're you're talking about. And, and we've seen instant changes in the way that they work. They, they become more creative. They become more innovative. Frankly, they become happier. They become, you know, they feel like they're actually doing something of, of value with their job and they seem just happier in, in, in their work. And one of the byproducts of that I've seen is, is honestly jealousy. So you have these other organizations and they're like, wait a minute, we're coming into the opening scene of Joe versus the volcano here and going to work in this dungeon where we're being, you know, micromanaged and this is horrible. And we're looking over at this other group in our same building and our same company and like they're on the beach and there's a palm tree overhead and someone's handing them drinks and they're happy. I, I want that. I hate those guys. Why? Why is? Why don't we get this? Do you? Do you see that happening? Um, and and how do you counteract that as you're you're starting with these outliers and then trying to spread more to the larger organization? No, oh, yeah, you you definitely see that. Um, and and before we get into that, one of the things I think that needs to be said is, um just when we talk, so from here forward and, and looking backwards, when we talk about people's psychology, a lot of, a lot of people walk away from that thinking that you somehow defined people's limitations and capabilities. And I think that's really um, a bad way of, of thinking about it. I think the better way of thinking about it is that psychology describes kind of a stable set of motivations. And uh, when we talk about change aversion, for example, and the, and training shih tzus to do the job of bloodhounds 
it's not that a Shih Tzu can't smell. It's that they're just neither as good at it nor as motivated by it in their actions. And that's that's kind of how to to think about about people and the the addressing the jealousy and kind of catching the rest of the organization up um to an outlier is a tricky question and i i kind of always describe it as a, what i what i say is the inchworm effect that you know the head of the inchworm will race way ahead of the ass and then before the head can really move any further, the, the ass has to catch up <laughs> and, and step. And that ass of the organization is usually what keeps the, the company from progress because something has done a really good job in most companies. And the, whether it's the jealousy or the, um, the, the traditionalist mindsets, et cetera, that are kind of anchoring the back end of the caterpillar to the branch, that's what we have to fight. So I think, um, I think internally we're, we're pretty poor marketers as companies. We don't, we don't communicate internally as clearly as we do externally in many cases. And I don't just mean communicating, uh, our intents or our goals. I mean, helping people really wrap their head around what's happening. So I'm working with a company right now who just sold off a business unit. Um, they redid their logo. They um, restructured some things and they just kind of took these actions. And it's a, it's a really big company. And now all of a sudden, all these employees are saying, we don't know where we're going. We don't know why these things happen. We don't know what that means for me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of the executives are saying, well, why, A, why do we care if they know what it means to them? Uh, they're saying, well, why can't they understand this? It, it's logical. It makes sense for us to have sold that business unit and laid those people off because it was not performing, et cetera. And I was like, you just, the, that, and that's just a case of people kind of only thinking about it from their perspective and not doing what a marketer would do, which is get on the other side of the table and think about the receiving end of the message and the receiving end of the actions. And that's all we really have to do to be successful with outliers is to explain what's going on. Now it helps if the, a lot of times, I guess you could say there's two cases, Jason, that there's the outlier who's created themselves. Um, and you know, they just, they just kind of cut the ropes and said, we're doing it our way. Um, and then that doesn't have executive support and, and often is, is a dangerous way to become an outlier. And then there are the outliers that have executive support. So what I'm talking about with, with doing some good internal marketing are the ones that the executive team has said, we want to create an outlier. And then we have to have a really good internal campaign to message about this stuff. And, you know, the, the antithesis of that is this, uh, this BS innovation lab strategy that's going on around where it's basically we're creating this annex that nobody goes into or out of. And for the first six months, everybody's uh, happy that the company is showing an interest in innovation and look how cool we are. And then of course, most people realize, well, I can't benefit from that or be a part of it, or they won't talk to me. They won't listen to my ideas. And, and then what was for the first six months, uh, a thumbs up for the organization actually becomes a cancer on the organization very quickly. So I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's a simple answer other than get smarter people to think about how we're going to go about this, because if you're short sighted in how you go about it, which most people, you know, most, most of these situations are fairly short sighted, then you're going to have a pretty crappy outcome. Just like, just like when we were in middle school and you're like, I'm going to go ask that girl to dance and you don't really have a plan. <laughs> And you get to question number one or two and <laughs> things go so badly that five people on either side of that one girl are like, I hope, yeah, it, don't even bother talking to me next. <laughs> so it, it's just most of our plans are horrifically stupid and, and under thought. And that's that's the core of it. So I don't think people set out to be jealous, um, you know, right. on purpose. I think they're just confused and they have nothing to grab onto because there's no handles that have been provided by the organization and, and by the plan. And when you don't have handles, what choice do you have other than to sit there and grumble? 
Yeah, that that makes sense. So when these organizations are approaching you, what what are they coming to you with? You know, what are they saying? Where they they say, Evan, we we know we have to understand psychology. I don't think they're saying that. Do they say we feel like we're we're losing when it comes to innovation? I I'm guessing they're not saying that. So what what are what are they saying? They they know they have a challenge. They know they have a problem. Or are they so forward thinking that they know they want to be ahead of their competition, but they don't know quite how to get there? When when you have a company that approaches you, what does the conversation look like? Um. Yeah, I mean, most most of my business is not people approaching me, um, but it helps to break this down into some categories. So most of my conversations hap- happen with uh, CEOs or department heads in marketing or analytics or product. Um, and, and in that case, they... Uh, we're having a conversation about the untapped potential of the organization. And it's kind of like the symptom, the symptom you have to look out for is if, if the senior executives are in meetings with, with the rest of the team or the CEO uh, ends a meeting and then the door shuts and the CEO just buries their face in their hands going, oh my gosh, what am I doing wrong? Why can't, why are these ideas so bad? Why, why do the teams keep bringing me stuff um, that I can that I can pick apart and show the, the flaws in five seconds. I think that's a part of the problem because that's a signal that the issue you're facing has a deeper root. It's not, you're not doing some, you're not missing a best practice. You're not missing an application. You're missing your, your operating system is out of date or wrong, or, or even worse, your hardware is wrong and out of date. And I help the organization understand, um, A, if you scan the health of the organization, where are all the places where we need the upgrades? And then B, how do we sequence that upgrade path so that you get the biggest benefits as you go? Because just like a computer, you can upgrade a part, but because of another part, there's a it's cho- it's choked out, right? So you need to open up the locks in a certain order so that the most uh, intelligence flows to the organization. And we should talk about the idea of of intelligence in an organization because that's that's key to what I I do. Is it's mostly centered around boosting the organization's IQ, not the organization's uh, sweat. So the the other audience that I'll talk to are um, funded companies, founders of funded companies who want to kind of learn lessons that, um, that they're about to learn the hard way. They want to hopefully learn them the easy way. And then similarly, I'll talk to VCs and private equity firms about the companies that are in their portfolio and just helping to improve the health of those companies so that the health of the portfolio is improved at the same time. So there's just different audiences, but it's people who have an interest in the companies health because like you described earlier it's not just that you get better work products that people are literally like happier and that's that's a sign of health what we're trying to get here is not just better products but moving earlier up the chain healthier mindsets that naturally yield these great products and these great marketing messages and sales efforts and things like that so let's dive into that conversation a little bit more about understanding an organization's health and where they're at from an intelligence perspective. And obviously, we you know we, we couldn't solve all those challenges in an hour podcast, and that's what companies pay you to do to come in and solve. But I'm wondering if we can dive into it a little bit to give our listeners that may be running a team, maybe a director of an organization, um, some at least kind of guidance to walk away from this this episode saying, you know, I listened to Evan talk about this and it's given me some ideas at least how to get started because his message is really resonating with me. This obviously seems like a huge challenge to overcome, but I want to start somewhere. Can can we dive into that kind of aspect a little bit more? And and what would you recommend for people where this message is resonating? Like where do we start to tackle such a huge, uh, a huge challenge? You know, I love, um, there's a guy named Dan Pink who wrote a book uh, called Drive, and he gave a TED Talk, and in the TED Talk, he kind of opened up the um, the conversation with this 
contrast that he says there's a there's a startling difference between what science knows and what business does. So maybe we could we could talk for a second about what science knows, because um, there's a lot more that science knows than the way we feel about things. And and I like to tell people that psychometrics, which is the field of psychology, which is uh, concerned with experimentation and doing d- trying things out to see how people respond and then understanding the correlations of things. And I like to tell people that psychometrics is basically a field that is principally concerned with obliterating your opinions and theories about people. Because we all walk into our day thing like, oh, I believe people are like this and I believe people are like that. Well, you know what? You can free yourself of the burden of believing how people work because all your ideas are super dumb and have all been figured out through actual testing. And again, this stuff isn't a perfect science, but directionally it is way wiser than people's theories are. And we, it's, it's, it's tough because it's fairly inaccessible research, like scientific research and, and reading scientific studies and journals and the reports that these people create is kind of excruciating. And it's excruciating because all these studies are so interwoven to make sure that there's credibility to them. Anytime they study the correlation of psychological traits uh, or personality traits to any thing, what your willingness to do A versus B, um, they have to control and isolate that variable. So for example, EQ, like emotional intelligence, was popularized by a guy who really professionally was a journalist. It's And it got so popular that the psychological community, the psychometrics community actually tested for its existence and proved that it does not exist. Now, there is something that they uh, there are traits within the big five personality traits that do accomplish the same things that EQ accomplishes. But what they did is they said, can we, can we establish that EQ is independent from those things? And what they found is that there was 0.00 correlation uh, outside of the effects of the big five personality traits. And that's important because when we try to go fix something or we try to educate ourselves on something, we don't want to say, okay, I've got a pencil in my hand, and then somebody else holds a pencil and they say, well, I've got a lapidu in my hand. And then they go off and they try to figure out how to get the best lapidus. And they've got to like, you can't just, you can't rename a thing and then run a whole business about that, which uh, requires that you completely reestablish all of the science that's already been established on the thing that existed before you renamed it. And I know that's kind of like a rambling mess, but it's a really important concept that if we're going to start acting on our businesses and even socially, we need to work with real concepts that actually exist. And there's this whole field of study that I was unaware of uh, several years ago and became aware of and just got totally immersed in that looks at this stuff. So all that said, um, let's restart that question and and answer that with that level set in place, because I think that's all important background. Does that change at all what what you want to dive into? I, I don't I don't know if it changes it uh, or, or not. Um, it's a it's a big thing to to unpack. I guess what I, I what I, what I want to dive into, and maybe this is a good pivot point, um, because a lot of our listeners work in digital analytics, digital marketing, uh, and we kind of set out at the beginning of the conversation of, okay, let's talk about two things. Let's talk about the convergence or intersection of business and psychology, and then let's pivot the conversation and talk about the future of digital analytics. And, and I don't think it needs to be this hard pivot because I believe, and I think you believe that what we're talking about has a direct impact to what we see as the future for those organizations. And so maybe we overlay what we've been talking about and maybe focus a little bit more on our core listener base of people that are working in digital and saying, okay, we've been talking about all these things and the importance of psychology and how this is going to change the way business operates. So if, if I'm a analyst, if I'm a analytics implementer, if I'm a VP of marketing, 
what does the future look like for me, given this conversation that we've had for the last 40 minutes? And if I'm in a position, whether as an individual contributor, um, maybe I'm someone that has a, a voice that is is really heard in the organization, or I'm a VP or a director of a team, what do I need to be thinking about in order to make sure that I'm on kind of the cutting edge of, of what we're talking about here and and ahead of the, the game? Um, short of going in and bringing in Evan to do that. He's, you know, one person and can't solve everybody's problems. What can, what can they walk away from this conversation with saying again, what the message that Evan is telling us is really resonating with me. A I'm interested in how that will impact me personally. You know, what does that, what does my job look like in two or three years? And B, you know, I want to help, deploy something like this in my organization, but I have no idea where to start. And maybe that's too much to unpack, but that's kind of where my head's at. Yeah. Um, well, my capacity to get off track is extraordinary. So I'll, I'll try to, we'll, we'll try to break it up into a few things. So I, I think what you were asking earlier was um, practical, you know, translate this to some practical advice for uh, a department head. And I think uh, on a practical sense, Department heads have to become really good at evaluating the health of their organization. Um, and that's that a, that's a process that requires patience because your organization kind of runs in these different layers. You know, you, you have um, the layer of ideation and decision making and things like that. Underneath that layer, you've got things that facilitate decision making like meetings and research and design capabilities and strategy and planning. Um, and underneath that, you've got this layer of things that are required for that to go well, like people have to be smart and people have to be experienced and things like that. So it does require some patience. I think um, if you give yourself a quarter to do it and kind of say, I, I want to just trace the roots of what I'm seeing here. What are the types of people that I have? What things do they believe are true and what things they believe are not true? Um, you'll realize that you can actually be pretty precise about where you have health issues within your group. And then you can address those. And again, I would say with all the research that's been done, once you're precise, you can go find pretty good stuff or reach out to me on Twitter or whatever, and I can steer you in the right direction um, for how you might address it. One of the things we talked about earlier that I, that I want to anchor the whole conversation of moving this into the world of analytics in is IQ. And the reason I got on my rant about psychometrics is that there are a lot of people who feel like IQ is not real, even though IQ is like the most scientifically valid concept. It's been proven hundreds and hundreds of times um, and is very, very accepted in the scientific community as being very real and very indicative of things. And the, the, I, I don't know how many of the people listening to this have read Angela Duckworth's book on grit, which is talking about hard work and perseverance, which is a key component um, that's associated with the big five trait called conscientiousness. And conscientiousness, just to orient you to the idea, means how uh, industrious are you, you know, busy and focused and hardworking, and how orderly are you? So organized and and able to kind of work in sequences and 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 effectively project manage yourself. And conscientiousness slash grit um, is the second most correlated factor with success, with personal success. And different studies define success in different ways. Um, but certainly if you're, you know, a business, success is is has a has a fairly clear meaning for a lot of people. Um, and then on a personal level, it can be financial, it can be your independence, it can be different types of things that are whatever your priority is. But IQ is actually the most correlated thing with success. And there, and I'll try to kind of keep this organized. Um, IQ is five to six times more correlated with success than conscientiousness. And I believe the reason for that is that hard work, you don't get anywhere without hard work. It's kind of like the fuel for your company. But IQ is the engine for your company. And the engine determines what your miles per gallon are and how much exhaust you create while you're driving. 
So fuel can go into the engine and you can go not very far, making a lot of heat and sound and pollution, or the fuel can go into the engine and you can go really, really far producing almost no exhaust. And IQ is effectively your, that engine, which determines how, how valuable your hard work will be. And a lot of that is due to the fact that, that organizations, let's say, of higher IQ learn things faster. So if you learn faster, then you can embed skills more quickly. You can uh, learn how the market responds to your efforts more quickly. So it, it totally makes sense that you cover more distance with the same amount of, with the same amount of fuel, uh, the smarter that you are. So what I don't think is a productive conversation is getting to IQ on the individual level. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to worry about organizational IQ or what I call superhuman intelligence. And that should be the goal of every department head to establish superhuman intelligence within their group. And what superhuman intelligence relies on is addressing your bias. That's what allows us to be smarter than any one person. So if we picture two people arguing, human level intelligence is one of those people winning. But if we want superhuman intelligence, what that actually means is we're going to combine the intelligence of those two people, which, which means we have to get them to stop arguing and you have to get them to start asking each other, what am I missing? And that's a way of offsetting bias. So you can say, if I'm not a very compassionate person concerned with power, I can say, what am I missing? And the person who understands the world through this lens of compassion much more clearly can say, you're missing A, B, C, D, and E. So now both people in the room have achieved an aggregate IQ that is much, much higher than either one of them. And, and when I say IQ, I mean that in a mechanical sense, that if you start asking them to make decisions, their decisions are going to be way better than either one of them would have made decisions with before, which makes the engine more efficient. So that's, that is the pursuit of the department head. And that's why we care about the health of the organization. And that's why we have to look in these different layers to figure out where is IQ getting demolished. And most companies struggle with this cross-departmentally because most people say, if you're in product, you make the product and you in sales, you go do sales. Well, one of the most valuable inputs to a product organization is the reality of what salespeople see every day. And another one of the most important things is the reality of what support people see every single day. So if the product team wants superhuman intelligence, they need to go to sales and say, what am I missing? And they need to go to product and say, I mean, they need to go to support and say, what am I missing? And now they've achieved the capability of better decisions than they could have ever achieved on their own because they're not a salesperson. They have no way of getting that insight without asking for it. So this whole notion of divide and conquer is actually leaving companies feeling very divided and broken up and, and um, antagonistic internally. And it's decreasing the IQ of the organization because we're relying only on the individual's IQ, asking them to do their job by themselves. So we can get into more you know, tactics of where they could look, but I, I hope that's enough for people to say, do we have superhuman intelligence? The answer is usually no. And we can say, well, clearly here are the barriers to us covering our bias. A, we don't feel comfortable talking about our bias, so it never comes up. We don't feel comfortable saying, what am I missing? Because people will say, well, I thought you were good at your job, right? <laughs> like it's an unsafe environment. There's so many easy to discover reasons that you can patch and, and make a huge difference in a short time frame. So what do, what do we say to the, the person that says, that's, that's great, um, but I, you know, I spend all day configuring variables in Adobe Analytics, or uh, I spend all day trying to get data in and out of BigQuery, or I spend all day trying to understand what my boss is asking for when he gives me a, a piece of paper with a drawing that I'm supposed to replicate uh, in, in our data visualization platform. Um, what do we say to them? We say, this is great. I get it. But I don't have that kind of voice in my organization to say, hey, guys, by the way, we're not thinking at a superhuman level and we didn't make changes. What, what do we say to them? You know, what, how does this impact their, their kind of job and their future? And what should they be thinking about? Yeah. I, I, so I'm going to stall on your answer for two seconds because the purpose of me starting this business um, after selling a company and, and, and having a little success in life is to make sure that those people are 
disproportionately advantaged moving forward. So right now, the advantage goes to those who are focused and diligent and produce results uh, on this, uh, on a, in a very heads down quarterly mindset and less uh, and, and less it favors people who think long-term far, far less. And the purpose of this business over time is to make sure that the decision-making process is way more inclusive of people who think uh, with, with these different mindsets. And it's not that we're going to abandon any of the current mindset of quarterly goals and MBO and all that kind of stuff. It's that that needs to be supplemented because that is not an innovative, progressive, adaptable mindset by its nature. So we have to do that while doing other things to supplement the stupidity of that approach because every individual approach is stupid. If we just think about the future all the time, we'll go out of business because we won't make enough money to stay in business. If we think about the present all the time, we'll make enough money today, but our customers will become less satisfied. Our employees will probably become less satisfied. We'll do things that are poor trade-offs in order to reach our goals. And then eventually we'll be very disruptable in the market. So that's the effort of the company. Um, for now, I would tell people to to get into making content for one thing. I mean, if I'm being blunt, you're kind of screwed within your organization. You can you can try to uh, facilitate some of these activities, but like we talked about earlier, the the sanctioned outlier versus the pirate outlier inside the company, they have very different fates. And if you're a sanctioned outlier and, and the company's offering an opportunity for people to rise up and, and share those perspectives and help us achieve superhuman intelligence, then jump at it. Absolutely. If you don't have the power, then you really, your, your only choice is to be that pirate who cuts the ropes and goes your own way. And uh, if history is a teacher, you know, we know that you're going to end up in the guillotine by doing that. So and that's okay because in this in this industry, uh, you can you're very very hireable before you end up in the guillotine. So you can start to get some of that success. You can become an outlier without any support whatsoever. You can become a standout success, breaking the rules. And many many people do that. Eventually, that will catch up to you and they'll kill you. But if you get out before they kill you, then you can get out and say to the next place, here's all the stuff that I did. And it worked. And here are the results. And now I want to do that in a place that has more budget and more um, backing and drive and intentionality around producing these results. And I, I, I hate to get on your podcast and tell people to quit their jobs. But that's exactly what I'm going to do <laughs> is say, don't waste your time trying to get the Chihuahua boss to, to figure out where the trail is. Like, don't do that. That's a, that is a dumb way to spend your life. You need to do what you can to make a, a success occur and become an outlier. And then you need to use that story to fuel your life and fuel a brand and a boss and a team that does care. I'm trying to figure out um, a good a good stopping point because we can keep talking for hours and I, I think it's pretty clear that we're going to have to if you'd be willing have you back on to drill deeper into some of these topics because we could just keep going and going and going it's fascinating to me but you did say something that triggered a question that I have to ask uh, in this episode. So we're talking about outliers and whether you know it's sanctioned or, or not one of the things that I've seen is that you organizations do recognize it, right? They recognize these outliers as as being what they need to move the organization forward. Um, and even if it's even if it's kind of rogue or as a pirate, as you put it, um, they still see it as highly valuable. And they say, you know what? Evan is doing an amazing job. He's an outlier. Let's put him into management. And, and, and that's going to move our company forward. Oh, by the way, Evan, now that you're in management, you can't be a pirate. You can't be the outlier. You know, this is the this is kind of the role that you have to play as, as a manager. It's different from an individual contributor. And I sit back and think, but 
you, you, you guys put him in this position because he was an outlier. You saw that as being something different that could help propel your business forward. And then the minute that you put them in a position to have more influence in the company, you say, oh, but by the way, all those outlier things that you did before, you can't do those anymore. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, that's really common. Um, I, I, I forget all the people who have brought this up, but there's a lot of conversation that you see in social media about drawing a line between the definition of a manager and the definition of a leader. And, you know, a manager in, in a lot of these organizations, a manager is, is kind of almost, it doesn't matter if, if human beings work for the manager or if they're just watching over an assembly line of machines that they sometimes have to oil or, or, or repair. Right. I mean, it's like, their, their job is to focus on the output. Um, when you promote a person to become a leader, on the other hand, it's their voice that you're most interested in, not their ability to control. And that, that again, is the pursuit of, of superhuman intelligence. If you want the people with, the, with the best voices, um, to be present in in key discussions. And what I mean by voices is not just their ability to form ideas and share them, um, but their desire to understand their own bias and cover it, right? Like maybe it's it's the best um, conversationalists, not the best voices is the better way of, of putting it. So yeah, I mean, we're, you described at the very beginning of this an era where companies attempt to control and manipulate people to behaving similarly. And now we're talking about on a micro scale, getting promoted to a role where you're asked to control and manipulate people on a smaller scale. And we talked about how businesses are learning the lesson that that doesn't work. The fastest way for them to learn that lesson is for you to leave. And I, I do not think leaving should be the first action. The, the first action should be succeed and then, uh, you know, mic drop on your way out because that's, that's where everybody gets the message pretty clearly. That's where you don't quit and, and leave because you don't think you can do something. You can always do something. Um, and the organization loses a proven uh, performer at the same time because all, whether it's sanctioned or not, anytime you create an outlier, it embarrasses somebody. <laughs> and, and if people are uh, trying to understand what they're missing and they're, and they're proactive, then you save yourself the embarrassment. It's kind of like in a debate when somebody says, I disagree, instead of what am I missing? Well, now you're adversarial and somebody's going to look dumb. And once somebody looks dumb, their feelings get hurt, they want to retaliate, and everything gets worse. If they could just say, you know, I must be missing something here. I'm not seeing it. Now everybody's open and you save the embarrassment, you save the resentment and the retaliation. And it really is just that simple. So I, again, I think you get promoted to a manager and if they're not interested in, if they're not bringing you closer to them in order for your voice and your conversation skills to be, um, to, to improve their intelligence, then they're just asking you to be that old school uh, manager and you should go ahead and try to be a leader. Anyhow, get a result. That's, that's extraordinary. Uh, see if that works. And if it doesn't work, go find some, somebody who's not a, a moron. To work for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And my, my first boss out of college labeled it as there are, there are managers, there are managers who are leaders. And then there are people that really are leading the organization and I call them natural leaders. They don't have to have a title to lead. So um, I, I, I loved how he put that because regardless of our position, if we are a natural leader and, and we know how to move ourselves and organizations forward, our, our voice, our voice will be heard. Um, so, yeah. And it's important that there's, there's multiple types of natural leaders, you know, not all natural leaders are about driving results in the business, right? A lot of natural leaders are about helping us see things that we're missing. Uh, that's what visionaries typically are. The visionaries are not as concerned with achieving goals. They're concerned with not missing important things that are happening. And they're, they're concerned with being effective in the market. And you have people who are not concerned with the market or the goals, 
but they're very concerned with people's uh, emotional attachment to their work. And those are the people who create harmony within the organization. So clearly, if you're trying to reach your goals and you're missing things or people are dissatisfied, then you're going to have a hard time reaching goals because people are disengaged and, and acting on bad information. So it's really important for people to understand that leader does not just mean one thing. It, lead, it means multiple things that are each components of that superhuman intelligence. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this has been a, a fantastic conversation. I'm going to ask you to give us your, your mic drop moment. Like, give us your mic drop. What? Give us something that um, our, our listeners will walk away with. Um, and then we're, we're, we're going to have to have you back. This is we, I think we're just scratching on the surface here. Oh, I didn't, I have no idea what I might drop. <laughs> oh, come on, <laughs> Evan. You're full of awesome little uh, snippets of wisdom of goodness. Okay, how about this? How about this? We, we've we talked about a lot of really good content. Um, what's the one book that you would recommend everybody that's listening should have on their must-read list this year? I, you know, I don't know if it's relevant to this particular conversation, but it's relevant to almost all conversations in general. The, the book that Chris Voss wrote called Never Split the Difference is unbelievably good um, in two ways. Number one, it's really great at just giving you a, an unbelievable toolkit that you can test as you're reading the book and see if it works in your life for how to talk to other people much, much, much more effectively. And in experimenting with the ideas in my own life, uh, they've been huge. The second thing that that book does is it assaults an academic understanding of negotiating. And it calls out by name the book Getting to Yes, uh, which was written by uh, mostly a group of Harvard professors about how negotiating should work. And what Chris says in the book is that that theory of negotiating is almost a complete failure. And he details how the FBI used those techniques, where they failed, how they failed, and what he does instead. And I, on a personal level, I love uh, that that is such a key theme in the book because there are so many bullshit academic theories that people try to embed. And 99% of those theories come from people who didn't really do it. They, they weren't in it. Uh, they watched it from the sidelines and then tried to describe it. And you get the same kind of advice all over Twitter about being an entrepreneur and about how people work and all this stuff. And if you look at where the advice is coming from, it's coming from people who don't do it, who don't, who don't have their hands dirty and don't really understand the nuance. And I, I, the emotion that I get when I read a book that destroys an academic theory so beautifully, I, I can't even describe that emotion. It's such a, it's such a wonderful, warm feeling. And uh, I just wish that people would scrutinize who they're listening to quite a bit more than they do today. Love so it. That's Chris Voss's mic drop. Yeah. And, and I have to go reread it. it. It is a phenomenal read and it changed the way I did so, did so many things instantly. And there's a lot to uh, unpack in that book. Um, but there's so much that you can just take away and make immediate changes that have a really lasting impact. So I, I think that's a great recommendation. So man, have absolutely loved the conversation. Thank you, Evan, for, for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, Please go check out what Evan is building at Core. It it really is revolutionary and and changing the way businesses think and and making them more innovative. You can go read more on his website, Core Consulting Dot Partners. Uh, as he mentioned, if you have questions, if you want to pick his brain about some of these things, he's very he's very easy to access. Hit him up on Twitter at Evan Lapointe. Um, you you know you're never disappointed walking away from a conversation with with Evan. So if you have things that you want to learn more about or have questions for Evan after listening, by all means, you know, track him down and uh, he would be more than happy to, to engage with you. So thank you, Evan. This has been fantastic and uh, definitely hope we can have you back. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. I know a lot of this is kind of a rambling mess, but it's, it's, there's so many pieces that kind of connect in with each other. And hopefully this lays some of the groundwork and we can talk in the future about you know, how, how do you apply it tactically to things in analytics and elsewhere? 
Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to reach us, you can do so by emailing podcast at 33sticks.com or on the web at www.33sticks.com. The 33 Tangents podcast is a production of 33 Sticks.